Now guess what kind of interview we have for you today, you got it, an awesome one. Professor Richard D. Wolff, uh, he is the leading Marxian economist in the world, Ooh, as my grandma would say. He's a professor of economics emeritus at the University of Massachusetts, he's now uh, currently a visiting professor at the graduate program in international affairs at the New School University in New York. Uh, he launched the academic journal Rethinking Marxism, uh, which we are finally beginning to do. He launched that in 1989, <laughs> finally we're listening to him. And he's co-authored or authored uh, 13 books including the latest one, Democracy at Work, A Cure for Capitalism. Interesting. Uh, Professor Wolf, great to have you on the Young Turks. Thank you very much. All right. So uh, your work has been getting a lot more attention recently, uh, which I think goes perhaps to the sorry state of capitalism that uh, we have today in America. Now, I often call myself a capitalist and I believe in free markets. First question is, uh, do we have free markets? Do we have capitalism here in the US? Well, I think we have capitalism, but capitalism itself has never had a free market. Uh, not in England where the modern form of it was born, uh, not in Europe, not in the uh, Western Hemisphere. A free market means, if it means anything, uh, according to the textbook, a situation in which all the buyers and all the sellers are large in number so that none of them can influence the market in any way other than by what they buy and by what they sell. And that in addition, no outside non-economic force uh, is in a position to shape market outcomes. The reality of our capitalist system, where it has existed in the world, has never exhibited anything remotely like that. Market players have tried and found countless ways to manipulate markets to their advantage, and they have taken those steps, and countless non-market or non-economic uh, institutions have done likewise. The result is, I think we have capitalism, but we have it with uh, a market that is as much shaped by forces outside buying and selling as it is shaped by the buying and selling itself. I think it's nearly indisputable other than for you know zealots or people who profit off the system to accept what you just said, because it's just a matter of fact really. Um, now I want to go to the other end of the spectrum and then see if we can meet somewhere in the middle. So in your ideal world, what is Marxism and how would that work? Marxism is a critique of capitalism. You know, uh, the best way to understand it is that when any system arrives on our planet, not just capitalism, but slavery, feudalism, uh, any kind of system you would identify. When it arrives, when it becomes dominant in any part of the world, it always generates people who love it and celebrate it on the one hand, and people who are critical and think we can do better as human beings on the other. Uh, Adam Smith and David Ricardo, usually considered uh, the founders, if you like, of the modern uh, science of economics, were both celebrants, they liked capitalism. They celebrated it as a great advance over feudalism. Karl Marx, who came a few years after them, agreed with them that it was an advance over feudalism, but disagreed in the sense that he said it had major flaws and that the human race could and should do better. And the end result of his perspective was to produce an analysis that is fundamentally critical. And my only final comment would be, if you want to understand capitalism, you need to look at and learn from those who think about it and analyze it from a celebratory perspective and those who analyze it from a critical perspective. And we live in the United States, which has been uh, so frightened of Marxism, uh, erected such a taboo against it that you know you and I have to be here now discussing something that's really obvious, namely 
that a proper education uh, to understand capitalism needs to look at Marx as a critique uh, just as much as it needs to look at Adam Smith, David Ricardo, and countless others who were celebrants of the system. So I fall squarely in the camp of both celebrating and criticizing capitalism. I think anybody with sense would fall in that camp for almost anything you discuss. Exactly. <laughs> right. Exactly. So, so let's the talk point, about the point. The point is not to make the Marxism exclusive and exclude the other perspective. The point really now is to grow up, become adults and say, let's hear what the critics have to say, let's see what's persuasive, let's see how it can improve the situation we all have to live in, uh, and stop having a taboo uh, about a critical perspective. It's really something uh, we ought to grow out of and beyond. Yeah, I both celebrate and criticize ice cream. It's delicious, but it exactly. does add pounds. So <laughs> there is some sensible ways to get to uh, to uh, better policies through uh, analysis. So let's do that. Uh, so let me ask you, I don't know if it's an oddball question, but it, one that I've always been curious about and it makes sense within the context of this conversation. Which government do you think does the best job of finding, if the middle ground is the appropriate place, a middle ground where uh, they execute the better parts of capitalism while checking some of its excesses? Well, in the world today, I think uh, not that they get quite to the happy medium you're suggesting, but they certainly are closer than we are here in the United States. I would identify places like Scandinavia, Germany, France, uh, and a number of other uh, countries in Western Europe that have chosen, uh, perhaps that's not the right word, that have evolved politically so that they have a combined system in which there is a role for markets and private enterprises on the one hand, but there are strong limits, uh, heavy government involvement, uh, because so many of the results of private capitalism are unacceptable socially, and they've taken the steps uh, to, to make that a real part of people's lives. And just to give you a couple of examples that usually amaze Americans, uh, in most European countries, uh, there is a national health service and has been there for decades. In most of these European countries, a worker, once he or she joins the workforce, um, is uh, legally required to be given four or five weeks of paid vacation. Uh, people in these countries have publicly funded education, not just at primary and secondary levels, but right on through the university. And the right rationale for all of these things is that it makes a better life for everyone to live in a society that really nurtures its people uh, as well as uh, giving them incentives to produce, et cetera, et cetera. So let's take a couple of those uh, countries as an example. Now, here in America, when you say France, uh, a lot of people's reactions, obviously, especially conservative reaction is, uh, no interest whatsoever. You see, they, uh, uh, <laughs> the French, they can't get anything right. But to legitimize at least part of what they say, uh, France, I believe, is highest income uh, tax bracket is around 70, 75 percent, something in that ballpark. Um, and That's here, right. And here in America, that would make heads explode, of course, and people would scream in unison, freedom! Uh, is there validity to the thought that, hey, you know, perhaps that's too high and that's not a price we're willing to pay in this society um, and, and that they haven't struck the balance right? Well, I think that our own history refutes that. Uh, if you take a look at the history of the highest bracket of the income tax in the United States, you'll quickly discover that in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, the uh, highest income tax rate was indeed 70% in the 1970s and actually 90% in the 50s and 60s. So that we as a nation have in fact, in the not so distant past, had levels of taxation that we 
believed as a nation, and let me underscore that both Democratic and Republican Congresses passed those tax rates, and both Democratic and Republican presidents uh, endorsed them and uh, administered them in our society. So we have a history of doing that also. And the interesting reasoning at the time was that we had just been through the Great Depression of the 30s, we had been through the horrors of World War II, and that we needed as a nation to rebuild our economy, to recreate the jobs and incomes that our people needed and wanted, and it was universally understood that such a goal could not be accomplished by a private capitalist economy. It would have to be led by the federal government and that everybody ought to be required to pay according to his or her capacity, which meant income tax bracket over 90% for people at the top. And a, a footnote, those high income tax brackets of the 50s, 60s, and 70s occurred together with an American economy growing much faster than it has in the years since then when we lowered income tax brackets and the unemployment rate in the 50s, 60s, and 70s was systematically uh, better than it has been for most of the years since then when we imposed much higher tax brackets. So we're, we're not so different from the Europeans uh, in terms of our history. We're just different in terms of the last 30 years where the United States and Britain veered away from what was a consensus before then. So, Professor Wolf, again, those are facts, and I, I know that there's a great uh, irony where conservatives talk about the golden era of, of America in the 1950s and 60s, and in that golden era, we had uh, income tax for the highest bracket at over 90 percent. So, right. <laughs> there's considerable irony there. I, I still happen to think that that rate is too high. Um, my personal opinion is that the highest bracket should be 50 percent. Uh, where you know you give back half of what you earn f for the society uh, that helped you make that money. Um, what I'm worried about, honestly, is, is twofold. One is just a matter of, in my opinion, and this is just an opinion, justice. That if you make the money, that you should really keep a decent percentage of it. Uh, keeping 10% of the money you make sounds a little absurd to me, honestly. Um, and. But the second part of it is that I think the government can do great things like build highways, bridges, land on the moon, defeat the Nazis if we need to, um, and provide even health care uh, for Americans so they have an opportunity uh, to accomplish great things and add to our society. On the other hand, I also think the government can get too large. Uh, I think it spies in on us, it goes into wars that we don't need to go into, uh, gives the money to defense contractors, oil companies, etc. So I'm not sure I'm on the side of letting the government have as much money as a 90% or even a 70% tax bracket would create. What do you say to those criticisms or thoughts? Uh, I agree with, uh, with all of that, and I think a Marxian perspective would, would agree to that as well. You know, if we had time, we could ask the question, why does the government do many of the things it does that so many of us don't want, don't need, oppose, but put that aside for a minute. Let's go back to the issue of the taxes itself. The government of the United States has never relied exclusively on income taxes levied on people. It has also relied on income taxes levied on corporations, uh, businesses. Uh, there's a profits tax, or if you like, a tax on business income that is separate from the income of individuals. And let me give you an idea of its history. Uh, at the end of World War II, uh, for every dollar that the federal government uh, got in income tax on individuals, it got a dollar fifty in income tax on business income. And so it relied more on the business side of our economy rather than the consumer slash worker side. 
if you look at the same relationship today, for every dollar that the federal government gets from individuals today, it collects from taxes on businesses, income taxes on businesses, 25 cents. In other words, the last 50 years has seen not only a dramatic drop in the income tax bracket on the richest Americans, but it's also seen a mammoth shift of the burden of taxation at the federal level off of business and on to individuals. Most Americans don't even know that, let alone approve of it. And if we were to have a serious na national discussion of taxation, which is, Lord knows, overdue, well, then we would have to ask not only about income tax on individuals, but also income tax on businesses, which we've always had. And then we could even expand it to talk about taxes not on income, but taxes, for example, on property, because the United States has the weirdest and most unfair property tax system uh, that I know of, and it, it's worse in its injustice uh, than the income tax uh, ever was. So now we get into my wheelhouse of how those things happen, and, and I know. Uh, I know how uh, multinational corporations seize control of our government. Uh, it's not American corporations, there is no such thing anymore. Shareholders are from all over the world, and executives are from all over the world, and they uh, poured money into our political system, and they basically bought all of our senators and our congressmen, and unfortunately our Supreme Court. So it's not an accident that we went from a big percentage of our income coming from uh, corporations to a tiny percentage of our revenue for the government coming from corporations. It is by design and it is at the root of the problem and it must absolutely be changed if we're going to retake our government from the machines that we created, these things called corporations. So I, I understand all of that, um, but outside of politics, and I don't know that there is a good way to answer this. Uh, how do we do that? So, and, and I guess the question I'm uh, getting at is, how do other countries do it? So, uh, are there systems of government, um, like in Germany, for example, where the incentive system is structured differently to get you a different result? Yes, I mean they have a different political history. They have a different political structure, and so. There are things that we do in the United States that are simply not allowed there, and there are things uh, that we can't do in the United States, which in those countries they simply take for granted. Uh, so for example, in most of those countries, there is a working class that has a long history of maintaining its own uh, economic and political uh, institutions and organizations, trade unions on the one hand, and political parties that are anchored in the working class on the other. The, these are socialist parties, communist parties, uh, nowadays anti-capitalist parties, calling themselves that. And what they do is they allow the kind of a perspective on limiting and shaping uh, a society in ways other than those dictated by private corporations. And the private corporations, who have a lot of power there, don't misunderstand me, do not have the kind of free reign, uh, the kind of absence of another kind of uh, point of view, another kind of political objective. And that shapes a society that trains its young people uh, to be aware of critical perspectives about capitalism, uh, to be unafraid of exploring them because it doesn't even occur to them that that would be disloyal. Uh, loyalty isn't defined as being pro or anti-capitalist. You can be loyal either way. Uh, these are things that their history has taught them. Uh, we haven't had that experience. Uh, the Cold War is still unfortunately much with us because it's convenient for the big corporations to have the kind of absence of real opposition, uh, which is a luxury that in many of these European countries they simply don't have. 
So I've heard in passing about how German companies have their boards composed and that it's dramatically different than how we have it here in the US. Can you tell us Correct. a little bit about that and the consequence of that? The simplest way to describe it, uh, which will shock Americans who are not aware of it, is that for many years, uh, the German uh, law passed by the German parliament in all the usual ways uh, goes this, this way. Every German company with 2,000 or more employees, in other words, every large German company, must give its workers one half of the seats, slightly under one half of the seats, on the board of directors. And those are workers who are elected by the workers in the plant to represent their interests uh, when it comes time for the board to make all those basic decisions, what to produce, how to produce, where to produce, and what to do with the profits. Uh, and that has been uh, very successful in the, the German worker power uh, at the highest levels of corporations as having a lot to do with the fact that over the last five years of the global economic crisis, German unemployment has been on a continual decline, radically different from what happened either in Britain or the United States. Uh, the mass of their people have done much better over the last five years than they did before, again, quite different uh, from what uh, has happened in the United States and England. So they are both uh, determined uh, believers in that system, but sitting now in the very uh, comfortable position of saying uh, it's worked real well for us, uh, and what's the matter with you Americans? that you can't even imagine, let alone explore, the how and why of its positive role in the German economy. Well, so let's imagine it. Uh, why is it that, that that's worked better? Because you're right, I mean, it would make heads explode here in the US. Give workers a voice in how you run the company? Are you crazy? They'll want to pay themselves way too much and they'll run the company into the ground. That's what almost every uh, American on television, at least, would say. And not, it's not an accident either. but. Uh, but how does it work? Why, why does it work better? Well, it, it's a great question. Let me ans answer first by taking a, a gentle jab uh, at those folks you correctly portray as saying silly things like the workers would pay themselves higher wages. It's silly because it's an insult to a working person. A working person knows just as well as any executive uh, that to make a successful product, it has to have good quality, it has to be affordable. Uh, this does not require rocket science. And I tell you this as a professor of economics all my life, um, I can assure you that working people um, not only know this, but probably know the details of what's affordable and what isn't, and what's good quality and what isn't better than the shirt and tie executives uh, who rarely come down on the shop floor and who buy uh, in a very different set of stores than most working people do. So I think it's successful because it does something which Americans in other areas understand perfectly well. Most Americans would tell you that if you own your own home, you're likely to take better care of it. If you own your own car, you're likely to take better care of it. Well, the same logic applies to your job. If you have a real stake in your job, if your income uh, depends on how well it goes, but also you're part of the decision-making apparatus. You just don't just do what other people tell you, but you're also involved in the design, the direction, the management of the company. You will have a much greater vested interest you will know more and you will care more. To make it in simple language, workers will be more productive, they'll care more about fixing things that go wrong, anticipating problems, because they'll be part of the decision-making and ownership apparatus. So I'm not surprised that when workers form co-ops 
or when the uh, law requires workers to be part of the decision-making apparatus, all kinds of productivity gains, all kinds of improvements in the productive part of the economy uh, are the result. We don't exclude workers in this country uh, because it's efficient. We exclude workers because those at the top, in fact, want to do what they accuse workers of. If you look at what has happened to the uh, salaries of top executives of major American corporations over the last 30 years, you will see an explosion of those people paying themselves huge pay packages. They're the ones who ought to be the object of criticism of what happens if you allow uh, people to make that decisions and they're not responsible or careful about doing it. We have the concrete proof of what our corporate executives have been doing. For them to worry about what workers might do is the height of arrogance and the height of asking us to believe contrary to what we see. God, that's such a devastatingly good point. I hadn't thought of it in that context, and, and you're right. And so there's there's two elements uh, to that. One is I'm an employer here, and I know that the more that my employees care about our product, uh, the better we do as a company. So that's very rational, right? And so if you can get them to care by having ownership in in, in the decisions, then obviously you're going to get better results. And number two, you would think, well, wouldn't that apply to the executives as well? But it doesn't really. I'm reading a book now called Good to Great. It's a, actually just a business book on how you make great companies. The problem is with executives who have loyalty to themselves and jump from job to job to job and don't actually care about the company, whereas a lot of the workers, the labor at that company, can't jump from job to job. So they have to care more about that company than the guy who runs it. So it's it's absolutely fascinating. I mean, you, so when you talk about we need to do a real critique of the system that we have here, again, it seems indisputable. So so then let's go to a, a broader question of suggestions on how do we fix it. So for example, the system of putting labor on the board as the German companies do. That's a great example. Higher taxes on um, corporations. I think another advantage of that is that I know again here running a company. Um, that's a, a, a media company, that the higher our taxes are, the more it makes me want to reinvest in the company so I don't pay those higher taxes. And it then grows our business, right? So I understand those suggestions and I think they're solid, not just on a matter of justice, but as a matter of efficiency and getting to better results. What are other suggestions uh, that could help improve our system? Let me respond by giving another example from another European country uh, where I think we could learn a great deal. The country in question is Italy. In 1985, Italy passed a law, their parliament, uh, that gave workers who lost their job, unemployed workers, two options uh, for how to deal with the unemployment compensation system in Italy. The first option was like what we do in the United States, uh, namely a worker can get an unemployment check for a couple of years every week. The second option doesn't exist in the United States, but has existed in Italy, as I say, for over 25 years. In this second option, an Italian worker can, they can apply to the government to get their entire unemployment uh, money, the two years of weekly checks, as a lump sum right at the beginning. And there are two basic conditions. One, they have to get a lump sum in a business, a new one. And second, that that business has to be a worker cooperative not your typical capitalist top-down enterprise, but actually a collective effort of at least 10 Italian workers, it could be more. Uh, so what the government is doing is saying to these workers, look, it's more beneficial to Italy as a society and to you as an unemployed worker for you not to be on the dole for two years. 
it's more important for you to keep working, to keep your skills, to keep your connections, to work with other people. And you will be more likely to make that business successful because it's your own collective business and because you can't go back and get unemployment if this business you start were not to succeed. And finally, the Italian government said, we want workers across Italy to be able to see and engage with cooperative businesses. So they have freedom of choice, genuine freedom of choice. They will have the conventional top-down hierarchical capitalist enterprises all around them as they have had for centuries, but they will also now be able to compare those with co-op businesses, both as places from which you buy goods and services, but also as places where you work and spend your productive life. And that's an important social value so that Italians will be able in the years ahead, the law said, to make intelligent, informed choices about what kinds of enterprises they want to buy from and to work in. And that's a lot better than giving them no choice at all in a society that excludes non-capitalist enterprises and leaves them only with the take it or leave it of an enterprise system that most Italians know has serious flaws. All right, that's very, very interesting. Now, uh, final uh, questions here because you got me curious. So why is our property tax system the most unjust system in the world? Very simple. We only tax property in a significant way at the local level. It's important for folks to understand. An income tax taxes the money you earn as you earn it. A property tax doesn't tax your income, that's what income taxes do. A property tax says you must pay so and so much money based on the value of what you own, which is separate and different from the income uh, that flows to you in an ongoing way. So local government in the United States taxes property, land, buildings, automobiles, uh, business inventories, boats, things like that. The local government does not tax another kind of property, namely stocks and bonds and cash. Not only does the local property tax not affect bonds, stocks and cash, but state governments do not tax stocks, bonds and cash, and the federal government does not tax the property you own in the form of stocks um, and bonds and cash. So what we have is a property tax system that taxes the kind of property that middle and lower income people have, cars, boats, homes, land. It exempts from property tax at all levels the kind of property that only the richest amongst us have, namely stocks and bonds and cash, especially if you mean that in terms of any significant amount. And for me, as an economist, it has always been stunning that we would think it's reasonable to tax the property of those in the middle and the bottom, but exempt the, the form of property that the richest amongst us have most of their property in. It is so blatantly discriminatory that I think, and I think many economists share this view, that it is an outrageous uh, tilting of, of the property tax system in this country in, a, in an unsupportable and unjust way. Uh, and of course, if you're middle class, a lot more of your uh, income is or your wealth is tied in with your property as sure. in your house. Uh, and, right. and so then it becomes regressive as well. Uh, finally, uh, on the issue of Marxism, the reason I've never been able to support Marxism in general is because what we were taught in school, which was, uh, that uh, Marx thought that you should work as hard as you can and only take what you need. Um, and I've always thought that that was incredibly counter to human nature, that I didn't know a lot of people who work as hard as they can and only take what they need. Um, so am I wrong in understanding of Marxism or, or is that an issue that, that, that it doesn't seem to quite match human nature in that sense? Well, with all due respect, you are wrong. Uh, <laughs> I'm not surprised, I was taught the same way you were. Uh, and it came as a bit of a shock to me as I was growing up. 
uh, that the marks I encountered when I actually read what the fellow wrote uh, was so different from the the uh, uh, silly kind of hostility which passed for education uh, in the schools I went to. And I might say that here I am, a PhD in economics, a professor all my life. Uh, I might mention that I went to Harvard as an undergraduate. Then I went to Stanford to got my master's in economics. And I finally got my PhD at Yale University. So I'm a product of the, what most people think of as the best this country has to offer. And here I am, a professional economist, and I was never required to read one word of Karl Marx's critical uh, assessment of the economy. There is literally no excuse for that. So let me be real blunt. What M Marx was interested in were the achievements of capitalism, and he wrote quite glowingly about what they were, particularly in the realm of technology and other areas. But he was equally determined to point out its shortcomings, its failures, who benefited from it, who didn't, and how you could move at least generally in a direction that would hold on to the benefits of capitalism, but allow us to go beyond its failures and, and its flaws. You know, it's not that weird. And since we no longer are in a Cold War, uh, with the Soviet Union and China has changed and all of the stuff you and I grew up with, isn't it long past time for us to be able to engage what these critical folks actually said and stop dismissing them out of hand with uh, stories that are really the, the, the fruit of an overheated imagination whose historical moment is behind us? So in other words, no, uh there are no humans that work as hard as they can and take only what they need. Or of course there are such humans. Absolutely. Right, but but it's not it's it's not the case uh, uh, it, normally and that is not what Karl Marx was pushing for. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. It's not it would be naive and a little bit childish and whatever else you think about him, he was neither of those things. Fascinating. All right, it, this was a great conversation. Uh, Professor Richard Wolff, his book is Democracy at Work, A Cure for Capitalism. Thank you so much for joining us on The Young Turks. Thank you for the opportunity and let's try to do it sometime again. Absolutely.